activists led by Comrade Mavivi will trace our steps from where we come from to where we want to be. They will tell us about the past, our aspirations, and the efforts we have put in. They will probably tell us about reality, the real stuff, the resources, and the action or the lack thereof. Our respondents will deal with the commitments and endeavors from their own vantage points. And in the end, we will put the question Uh, am I audible? Yes, Kratandi. Okay. I was saying that in the end, we will have questions, comments from all the participants. And we hope that all the speakers of the day will be able to respond before we close. So once more, I want to welcome all of you comrades, friends, and we immediately ask Comrade Mavivi, Ho ala pate. Comrade Mavivi, the floor is yours. You have 10 to 15 minutes. Comrade Mavivi. Thank you. Hey, the host took time to unmute me. Thank you very much, Chairperson, Speaker of Parliament. Please allow me to remove myself from the screen as I speak. I think the comrades have seen me. was formed in 1912, where women were excluded as full members, but were given the status of auxiliary members, which meant that they could participate in meetings and various activities of the ANC, but could not vote or be voted into leadership. This was despite the fact that women were there, such as Charlotte Matlake, when the ANC was founded in 1912. The context of this, of course, is in line with many countries at that time where the right of women to vote was denied with the exception of Finland, where this was done in 1908. In the ANC Women's End, their full membership only in 1943 through struggle they waged through the Bantu Women's League founded by Charlotte Matake in 1913, later known as the ANC <coughs> Women's League. And also their participation in workers and community struggles. Most women are said to have cut their political teeth in the trade union movement, such as Aidam Toana, the first official president of the Women's League, Florence Matumela, Lillian Goyi, Ray Alexander, Francis Bart, and many others. The African claim, which was adopted by the ANC in 1943, called for full citizenship of all and equal opportunities, but it did not deal with the discrimination of women. Emphasis was laid on race, creed, or color. And the Committee of 28, which was set up by the then president of the ANC, consisted also of men only. In the 1950s, women played a role in the defiance campaign 
against past laws and Bantu education and saw the need to come together in 1954 and founded the Federation of South African Women, which adopted the Women's Charter, which was a predecessor of the Freedom Charter. The highlights of their political activism was in 1956, August the 9th, where women marched to the union building. At the conference of 1958, a big banner was hung reading Malibongwe Ika Malama Koskas. At this conference, the Secretary General, which was uh, at then Oliver Tambo, called on the ANC to fight in every possible way those outmoded customs which made women inferior and by personal example, he called on the ANC to demonstrate their belief in the quality of all human beings of both sexes. This was recognition of the role of the women and the need to address the emancipation of women and gender equality. When the ANC was banned, many women were banned and banished and had to go underground or in exile. These are women such as Winnie Mandela, Albertina Sisulu, Helen Joseph, Dora Tamana, Mildred Glicia, Margie Beliza, Mark Lina, Francis Bart, and many others who kept the fires burning inside the country. Those who found themselves in exile, led by Florence Mokosho, later Gertrude Chopper, organized themselves into, women's, into the women's section and joined Mkonto with Caesar and played a role in mobilizing international solidarity and participating in the international women's movement and struggles. They established a strong link with women inside the country and their struggles against forced removals, Bantu education, detentions, and killings of children, and also MKK does and apartheid laws. The period of the 1970s and 1980s and 90s witnessed the rise of the Black Consciousness Movement, student and academic activism. Within the trade union movement, women also organize themselves into women's committees. When the UDF was founded, women threw in their lot into the UDF and Albertina Sisulu was one of the presidents elected. In exile at that time, Florence Moposho, Gertrude Chopper, and Ruth Mompati became members of the NEC, that is in 1981. The first women's conference was convened in this year, 1981, in Luanda, addressed by ANC President Oliver Tambo, who had this to say, a woman's place is in the struggle and not in the kitchen. In our Belligate country, the women's place is in the battlefront of the struggle. Further, he said, the women's section is not an end in itself. It is a weapon of struggle to be correctly used against all forms and levels of, of oppression and equality and in the interest of a victorious struggle of the people. He also alluded to the fact that this struggle for women's emancipation should not only be fought by men, by women only, but should be fought by men and women alike. In 1975 to, no, the period between 1975 to 1985 was declared as the UN 
decade for women. Many conferences, seminars took place. Many debates and discussions also took place amongst women activists and also within the ANC itself. Among those which attracted our attention, both inside and outside our country, was the relationship between national liberation and women's liberation. The second ANC Women's Conference held in 1987, also in Luanda, debated such issues. It took several resolutions and future policies on women. It also called on the ANC National Commission to be set up, which will deal with the emancipation of women. This, of course, we know was only done after the Deben Conference where President Oliver Tambo was elected as chairperson and this National Commission was established in his office and women such as Frini Jinwala, Nomboniso Gaza were the people in that office. This led to the ANC to recognize the activities of various women which were taking place and the debates which were taking place both inside the country and the role women were playing in support of MK cadres who were executed such as Solon Matlangu to declare 1984 as the year of women. In the ANC January statement of that year, Oliver Tambo called on the ANC to make it its special task to organize and mobilize our women folk into powerful organizations and to unite the women into an active force for revolutionary change. In the period of the 80s, as the struggle was intensifying, the ANC and the mass democratic movement started discussing on the future constitution and policies of a democratic South Africa. Women played a role in the committees formed dealing with the constitution, health, education, security forces, etc. In December 1989, the ANC convened a special seminar dealing with women and the constitution. This seminar outlined the views of the ANC on a non-sexist, democratic, united, and prosperous South Africa. Concepts such as feminism and gender equality, which emerged were discussed and clarified. The seminar also discussed experiences from other countries where national liberation and socialism did not translate into women's emancipation and gender equality. On 6 to 20 January 1990, the women's section and the women in the democratic movement with the assistance of the Dutch anti-apartheid movement convened the Malibongwe conference in Amsterdam. This landmark conference enabled the women to crystallize the need for unity and formation of a structure to realize the emancipation of women. The conference also focused on the future constitution and policies for a democratic South Africa and the need to empower women in both urban and rural areas. From this conference, ANC policy processes were infused with the views of women. The unbending of liberation movement, the release of Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners on February 11, 1990, and the beginning of the negotiation process gave a big impetus to these developments and programs. 
In May 1990, the ANC National Executive Committee issued out a historic document outlining its position with regard to the emancipation of women and gender equality. The statement acknowledged that gender discrimination is structured in our society. It acknowledged that women suffer triple yoke of oppression and that the liberation of women is central to the struggle for freedom. It acknowledged the experiences of other societies which showed that the emancipation of women is not a byproduct in the struggle for democracy and national liberation or socialism, that it has to be addressed in its own right within our organization, the mass democratic movement and in society as a whole. In June, 1990, following the Khroteskir minute, a group of women returned from exile and together with the women from the mass democratic movement and the ANC underground structures established a task force to rebuild and reestablish the ANC Women's League. At the same time, the Women's League initiated the process of the establishment of the National Women's Coalition which brought together women from more than a hundred women's organizations and formations, which also included party, political parties to work together to draw a charter for women's rights. One of the principles were, which were adopted was that the Women's Coalition was not going to be a party political structure. Mm -hmm. During the period of the Codessa negotiations, the Women's National Coalition played a very important role in linking and supporting the women and political parties in the negotiations based on the broad consultation which was happening in the country of getting the views of women. It was the Women's Coalition which called for the establishment of the Gender Advisory Committee, which became part of the process of negotiations during CODESA, but it had a number of weaknesses. In view of the fact that there were working groups which discussed various issues and agreed, and only at that part, at, at that time, were those views sent to the Gender Advisory Committee to discuss. Despite the fact that women diligently went through what was discussed at CODESA and made their recommendations, it was very difficult to reopen those discussions which were regarded as closed and have been very difficult to negotiate. And thus the Gender Advisory Committee was rendered very useless during that time. The women took a decision that there is no way this could happen as it was frustrating to mainstream gender in the various agreements which were reached during CODESA. We were able, when CODESA was dissolved, to suggest that women should be given the right to particip participate fully in the negotiation process. And a recommendation was made, which was also agreed by the ANC from the women that for every delegation of the 18 delegations which were at CODESA, there should be a woman with full rights to speak. Comrade Mavivi, you've got one more minute. This opened a new chapter where women were able 
to discuss and be able to put right from the beginning of the discussion issues which affected them. It is this process which was able to make sure that issues of women were mainstream in the Bill of Rights, in the chapter dealing with the support for institutions supporting democracy, we were able to put into the constitution issues affecting women, which actually informed also the final constitution. We all know that those issues was the issue of non-racialism and non-sexism, equality, Comrade Maviv, are you still there? The right to life, freedom of association, the right to citizenship, social economic rights, labor rights, the right to property, housing, healthcare, food, water, and security of the person. We can actually summarize this by saying the right for, to equality and gender equality came through the tears and the activism of women. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank I'll you very take... much, Comrade Mavivi. I think what you may one what may have been left out, you will get a chance when you when you respond later Thank you, on. Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Comrade Mavivi. Comrades, um, I'd like to ask um, Comrade Itu. Comrade Itu, a young woman, young activist, where are we? What are we being challenged with? Please take the floor. Thank you, comrades. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning to all the panelists and all the comrades that are online. Um, I'm just going to go through the presentation that has been prepared. Um, I think Comrade Mavivi has touched on the historical background and the context within which the discussion takes place. So I'll just really go into uh, dealing with the issue of answering the question about what the current challenges are. And I think the point of view that I'd be moving from is one that says, understanding what the challenges that come from women are uh, requires that we also have a, a, an understanding of where we where we are right now you know and, and also where we, of the inroads that have been made with regard to economic transformation social transformation uh, GBV issues and sort of ends with with trying to ask the question to ourselves which what needs to be done um, so I think what's important is to really note the... Your, your, your Wi-Fi is unstable. To note that the issue around gender equity uh, is not new. Um, and I think just... Let me see. Uh, Itumele, your video Hello? is unstable. You are unstable. Your network is not so great. Uh, please continue if you can. Yes, ma'am. Yep. OK. Yeah, let's try um, now without your video. Is it better? Yeah. OK. 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 So the context is one as having been 
oppressed on the basis of their sex, race, and class. And I think in the current context, it then brings also to the fore issues around um, challenges facing women who are women and men who are gender non-conforming. Um, also just highlighting the issues around sexism, toxic masculinity, and patriarchy, specifically to say, how do those issues um, inform our understanding of, of um, you know, gender issues and equality issues in the current uh, context. Um, I think it's also important to think about the contribution that has been made by women. And I think Comrade Mabibi has spoken to that quite extensively. But specifically in this context to, you know, really take a moment to acknowledge um, the, the, the efforts that were made towards adopting the Women's Charter for Effective Equality, which I think sort of is the base done thus far. And I think that the, our understanding of gender issues then must come from, you know, the frameworks that, or fr from the frameworks that are there, some of which I've just noted here being the Beijing Declaration and its Platform for Action, the UN Resolution 1325, the African Union Agenda, and just some of the SDGs and, and other frameworks that exist. And I think the key thing with regard to this is to say, uh, we are not just shooting in the air, but there are systems, you know, policy. And I think the key point is then to say, it's not enough to have good laws and policies when women remain oppressed. And in understanding that we must ask ourselves the question about, um, you know, where are the gaps? Where, where are the gaps and what has been done thus far to sort of address those gaps? Um, this is just a context of saying, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really elevated some of the challenges that women face in South Africa and in the continent in general. I highlight the economic um, impact to consideration. The fact that while there's been, uh, you know, over the past year or so, COVID-19 um, in South Africa, we also have a, a persistent sort of pandemic of gender-based violence. And I think not only has the COVID-19 um, pandemic elevated issues around transformation specifically, you know, answering the question about the, the role of women. Um, but I think we've been consistently confronted with the challenge of, you know, gender-based violence, which, which I think in, in light of the, the protocols and the frameworks that exist um, so far, does sort of push us to saying, uh, or understanding the issue of GBV through the lens of human security. And I think, as, as an aside really to say, we must answer the question around uh, to what extent in South Africa at least does, um, you know, GBV pose a human security threat and to what degree should we sort of, you know, elevate that issue um, in such a manner. Um, but maybe just coming back to the, to the conversation of the presentation would be to say that um, I think as we look at where we've come from and understanding better where we are. Uh, the International Women's Day theme, which is one that says choose to challenge and should inspire us to say, um, even, even if we have made inroads in terms of, you know, policing and, that, and all of that, um, there's always an opportunity to challenge the work that has been done, primarily because Sometimes there's a, there's a disjuncture between um, what, you know, we have on, on, on paper, but also what the reality of people are. And I think before just going into a, a high level picture of, um, you know, where we are, I think it's important to note and, and say that um, all of us, uh, all of us living in South Africa, whether we're in the township, rural areas, those of us that work, work in the corporate sector, in the public sector, we all have quite a clear understanding of what the plight of women is in those particular spaces. And I think it's important not only to then identify the issue, 
but to then also say what needs to be done and what, what are the mechanisms that we will put in place in our choice to challenge. Um, so I think even from within the perspective of the ANC, it, it, it is an important opportunity to then say um, from where we are when we look at our structures um, in our branches, you know, which areas still sort of need a bit of, of moving around and, and challenging and pushing over. Um, it, it, so as to inform, you know, a way forward for, for gender equality and just gender politics generally. So from an economic uh, transformation point of view, it's really just to say, we know that women carry the brunt of poverty and inequality. Um, and I think our conversations must, must, you know, in a very radical way shift from noting, understanding and accepting the reality to saying at a practical level, at the ground level, you know, what are the interventions that need to be made? And I think important to that is also um, just taking into consideration that communities have a more important role in shaping, you know, the what next. Um, I think so just on, on the economic transformation, still a high level of saying, um, you know, we need to really start by saying, how do we measure and if how we've been measuring, you know, uh, gender sensitive policy making in so far as transforming the economy is concerned, um, where are the gaps? You know, we know issues around the vulnerability and precarity, you know, of the, of the workforce specifically for women, uh, taking into consideration that they sort of dominate the informal economy. Um, and I think also key to that is, is noting that um, in positions of, of, of leadership in, in the public sector and in private sectors to, to some degree, um, you know, things are not the same, definitely. Uh, but I think we need to sort of raise the discussion around um, what not enough has been done. And I think there is an, an, a necessity to sort of ruffle the feathers a bit and be very intentional in, you know, including women, not just women, but also young women. And, um, you know, yeah, just, I think there just rises the issue around positionality and intersectionality, which is quite key in, in, in economic transformation. Um, I think, you know, in so far as, as social transformation is concerned, you know, the issues are many. Um, but I think the key question is really to say, to what degree um, are people's lively, have people's livelihoods improved? Um, and of course, we know, you know, there's, there's great strides that have been made in terms of, you know, improving the basic life and access to water, housing, et cetera. Um, but I think uh, the question unanswered specifically as it concerns um, you know, young, the younger, you know, generation. And I think also key to that would be understanding the structures, institution, and maybe to say, in what ways do the structures that exist in society, whether through the law or traditional leadership or, you know, governance, um, to what degree do those assist um, the work of, 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 trans, of gender transformation and, and dealing with issues around gender equality and equity. Um, uh, in terms of women and health, I think we know just from, from what we've seen that you know, a pandemic like the COVID-19 pandemic um, sort of potentially undo, un, undoes or uh, regresses, causes a regress in some of the inroads that have been made in so far as health is concerned. And I think um, really key to this would be understanding the importance of, of you know, universal health coverage and the NHI in our context. Um, and then saying that that should be the specific lens within which we understand, um, you know, the gender specific uh, reproductive you, issues that women have to deal with. Ma? Can I interrupt you? Can the co-hosts please make sure that uh, the slides are flighted? 
I see them, but I notice that a number of people are saying they are not seeing the, the presentation. Yaha, Comrade Itu, do your best, please. Comrade Itu, please uh, continue. Your time is almost running out, Manaka, but I do understand that okay, I keep on interrupting you because of the instability of the network. Please continue. Comrade Itu? Okay, I am almost uh, approaching the end. Yes, yes. So please, I'll just maybe know. move from the slide and, and say that, um, yes, ma, can you hear please me? Please continue. Yes, I, I think can. maybe just to 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 insert in the uh, a radical approach really would, would would okay would be to say that I think young women and women in general in this country have the responsibility to champion uh, issues around the national health insurance because I believe that. At the core of, I mean, women would be the, the main beneficiaries of a of a of a improved health system uh, that ensures there's access uh, to quality healthcare. So, if it were possible, you know, young women need to sort of uh, take ownership of of this because um, you know a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. So, we are unable to you know address some of the issues that that confront our economy and our development without dealing with the issue of health. Uh, but just to then move forward and to say the next time we speak to uh, education in general and just really raising the issue that, you know, there's issues of access which have quite, which have been addressed. Um, but I think we then need to say, what do we do with the many uh, unemployed yet educated women in this country? And I think a specific intervention, you know, the organization, but just from young people themselves need to begin to sort of, you know, come up. Um, and I think with regard to the issue of gender-based violence, the issue of GBV financing is one that has been taken seriously. Um, and I think, um, well, believe that, you know, with, with strengthened financing for uh, GBV issues, um, we, are, we will be better equipped to deal with, you know, the issue of building strong in institutions that, that, that focus on, on this area. Um, I think it is the responsibility of the organization and just the community in general to say, um, you know, how do we, you, of course, this country, and I think answering the issue of more is quite a complex one for many reasons. One being, um, you know, the issue of who speaks on the behalf of whom. Uh, but I do think that these issues are, are issues that belong to all of us. And, um, you know, we should sort of take them forward. Um, you know, just taking in consideration of time, I just want to quickly go to the part of saying what is to be done. And I think for me, what's important is, is saying we must adopt a community-based and sexual approach, uh, sexual approach that actively includes women in, cons in consultation. Um, identifying communities and issues that need specific intervention and establishing partnerships with relevant stakeholders is key. Um, strengthening capacity in the ANC and governance structures for gender mainstreaming uh, uh, is, is important. And this is also a data issue, you know, because we can't just be uh, unscientific and unfactual in our engaging, um, you know, issues around um, gender politics and, and, and you know, in, 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 um, bringing about equality. So I think, um, it's, it's yes, of course, it's a hard issue for some, but it also is a stats issue point of view then equips us to say, if there's money, where do we put the money to address this, you know, and where do we put the people. Um, so I think for me that's that's quite key. Um, I think this is just to highlight the issues of you know transforming the sectors that are quite uh, reluctant to transform and sometimes just not interested in transforming. Uh, just to end uh, with a quote from Bell Hooks to say, where she says that to build community requires vigilant awareness of the work we must continually do to undermine all the socialization that leads us to behave in ways that perpetuate domination. Um, I think this quote is important um, and it really equips us to, to, to say, 
to better understand where we are and where we need to go. Um, so I think with that, Comrade Chair, I will like to end my presentation. Great, Etu, thank you very much. With all the challenges, it's pouring in Cape Town. Um, I hope that the rest of the country has better weather. We can't complain too much, we need the water, but it does give a challenge when we want to deal with this. Uh, Comrade Maite, we need to invite you in. So what have we done? What are we doing? What are the challenges there in the doing of the things that will make gender equity a reality in South Africa? I invite you to take um, the platform, Comrade Maite. Um, thank you, Comrade Sestandi. Mm. The floor is yours, ma'am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, yes. I'm saying I agree with Comrade Magidi, but despite patriarchy, women have fought side by side, progressive women with their male counterparts. And that's why we can, with pride, sit here and say, we have a one year full of celebrating Meshalot McGregg. They, they, they were not spectators. They did not fear patriarchy. Of course, we know how they all perished. I have a long list and a very short time but by their soul rest in peace. But also, may the souls of those who have been taken away by COVID in a very short time, a, a calamity in our country, also do so and remember we love them. There is also a third genre of young women young women who get killed in their bedrooms by their loved ones. Yes, we know of gender-based, there is, there is generally in the world gender-based uh, violence, but with us, it's gender-based violence and femicide because you never know when the next girl, the, the girl next door, or in your own, own household, you'd wake up in the morning and she's not waking up and because you're all running, you know, to catch up, catch up with the Joneses, you discover on day two or three that uh, uh, it's not gonna be the same again. Um, we, we have, following up on, uh, Sesma Vivi and Sestant uh, Comrades, look back where we come from and the laws passed to ensure that gender equality and women empowerment is a lived reality for the majority of South African women and that this care can coexist in um, proudly being African, but not using patriarchy to suppress women. As a result, we have most revered constitution uh, in the world because human rights and gender equality are enshrined in this constitution. But what do we do with this constitution? The ANC led government uh, developed laws and ensure that this do not need uh, to end up, uh, you know, being an excuse for us to not also respect our constitution. 
Before 1994, women were allowed to legally own a home, a home in their own right. Currently, more than 50% of those beneficiaries uh, of those houses are uh, subsidized, owned by those who have the money. Though the uh, promulgation of several pro uh, protective uh, pieces of legislation uh, that were in, in act, particularly promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination against women and promotion of uh, administrative justice acts, Paja, access to justice have been improved. Women who have been marginalized before have benefited somewhat, but the struggle continues. Other laws promulgated include the three women's bills as they were called in 1998. The Democratic Violence Act, the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act, and the Maintenance Act. These were held as groundbreaking in protecting women from abuse uh, or abusive partners and restoring their dignity. But just this 19, 20, 20, and 2021, in fact, to be precise, Chair, 2020 June, we almost became uh, with Minister of Police and a uh, few who are in the IMC uh, undertakers. Because three zero, 30 young women um, were slaughtered. Daytime, one young woman found hanged on a tree while she was eight months pregnant, stabbed and hanged. And the follow up is that uh, it was actually a boyfriend who paid somebody some money to help him kill the, the would be mother of his child. I think as we talk of women, uh, uh, um, gender based violence, uh, and femicide. I have seen, we have encouraged, we, we're going around the provinces. I was in Limpopo yesterday, just to say, even boy children, because they are beginning to make themselves feel they are being excluded from that which we say, let's do together. Protect them, but make sure that they do not become their own enemies. There's just this very stubborn, uh, it's not our achievement, but it came by, uh, like a amoeba, where uh, if I lose my husband or he dies, and his son is still very young, somebody takes ownership of the house to protect me and the small children, but we never grow and it's allowed. So this is what we should fight against. Uh, employment Act, uh, equity uh, number 55 of 1998, which seeks to eliminate unfair discrimination and implementation uh, of affirmative action. You know, sometimes laws in South Africa are like good as the pens they were written on. Then later you realize that we, you actually need something strong here. We are not saying we want to build a, or draw laws that would end up being the Bible. There should always be improvement in a society, 
but it cannot be a total ignorance of the law and the usual continues to happen. I have a list here, which also by now, through the criminal law uh, or sexual offenses and related matters in South Africa, which was in 2007, would be, wouldn't be talking of gender-based violence uh, and femicide. It would be history. But that was in 2017. Labor relations amendments of uh, amendment of number 127 of 1998 should also protected women from an equal pace. So, sometimes like between a pay and just working for, for life. You stay in this farm, yes, okay. You are men, it's you and your four children. So you agree to just work and not get no payments. Broad-based, uh, okay, let me start with the one I love. Preferential procurement policy framework of number five of year 2000 would have made white a pay equality a very, very, very profound moment. But we are busy now. The Department of Women, uh, Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities is now tasked to work together with gender um, machinery to go door to door. So we are going to be going house to house. When I say house to house, I mean from institution to institution to check indeed we are practicing what we said we will live. Uh, and and maybe you have one more one. minute. Excuse me? You have one more minute to go. Okay. Uh, so far, um, the feedback we are getting, it's not good. We're even trying to use technology to help us check, uh, but Maybe it will, but it's still tough out there for women and ownership of assets in their own land, even after so many wars. Not war as in a war, but in so many battles. Lastly, uh, Chair, uh, we, we celebrate, we are not unappreciative. But besides all this, you know, not so, uh, you know, pleasant things, we now have 50-50% of uh, men and women in uh, cabinet. But lo and behold, in provinces, where provinces were instructed to do exactly that. In some provinces, one lady, uh, comrade was telling me yesterday that, uh, yes, there were five, five, now it's seven MECs against three. So meaning when they change, they do not put a woman to replace a woman. Mayors the same. Fewer women, uh, mayors from when we started the sixth administration than we have now, because they are replaced by men when they are capable women around. We also salute the fact that uh, the judiciary representation has changed uh, under the sixth administration. Uh, so besides uh, legislation and ANC-led government established the gender machinery, which is comprehensive, uh, institutional structure established following the guidelines of gender policy framework, guiding the roles 
of the functions uh, and the functions of uh, various structures uh, and agencies in our country. In few days time, because of time, Chair, I am having to cut half. Not half, my sister, your time is almost up. I'm giving you a few seconds to round up. I'm saying that uh, we, we, ANC has invited men and women members uh, of our society to celebrate one of unsung heroines, mm -hmm. Charlotte McGregor. It's starting with her birthday on the 7th of March in Botoko. Mm -hmm. Not just because she looked pretty, but her and her comrades did a lot to get where we are now. A lot of people don't even know where EME comes from, a church. It, if it was not for a defiance and a fight in a foreign country in America, it, this thing wouldn't, be, wouldn't uh, exist. I she must thank you, comrade, my, Thank you very much, my sister. Um, Comrades, friends, we have heard what the panelists have said. They've taken us from where we come from, what the challenges are. Comrade Maite has sketched out what law we have. Now we want to hand over the floor to Comrade Losi, to Comrade Ngaitube, um, to Comrade uh, Schreiner, to respond in their own um, vantage points, in their own looking at the challenges and what uh, has been done in South Africa and it, and even telling us what is happening in their own sectors. Comrade Lossi, I'm inviting you to take the floor. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Chair Mama Tandimukisa and greetings to the panelists and, and everyone that has joined us. Our response as a federation, we want to make a main point that we wish to emphasize that while we believe that there have been many positive legislative uh, and, and policy advancements towards gender equality in our country and significant progress with women's representation in the state institutions, we believe that that is not enough to achieve fundamental change towards non-sexism and women's emancipation. And inclusion of women in institutions of power certainly contributes towards creating conditions for the removal of gender inequality, but it does not challenge the structural basis of these inequalities. We believe that we need to take a radical step for far reaching change. We need to change the economic configuration of society and the structural basis of women's oppression. We need to draw on feminist traditions that point to the fact that the central to women's ongoing oppression is the intersection of sexism, racism, and capitalist exploitation. Capitalist relations chair of production depend on the unpaid care of women and the restriction of women to low wage sectors of our economy. The women's movement globally and here at home uh, have pointed to many ways in which women's bodies are sites of power relations and the control of women's sexuality and reproductive capacity that are core to the system of patriarchy. Now, over the past 20 years, the violent exclusion and exploitation of black working class women in the economy and the violence against women in our society have not been the central focus. We believe that instead these core issues, Chair, have been edged out by a version of liberal feminism that delinks formal equality from the actual outcome of equality. Mm -hmm. We also believe that it is crucial for all of us to address this. And we appreciate, Chair, that while the ANC has made significant progress 
in terms of policy development. But the organization has been weak in policy implementation and policy monitoring. And this weakness is particularly stuck in, and I quote, removing patriarchy and building a non-sexist society. That's where it is stuck. And we need bolder interventions for fundamental change. And we also want to say as also members of the Alliance that the ANC together with the Alliance, we need to develop a theoretical framework or an approach that builds on the ideas of a women's struggle that is led by women and in particular, the most oppressed African women. We believe, Chair, that it's time for a strong feminist perspective that must guide our struggle for a non-sexist and women's emancipation. We need a radical shift from the demand for the, for the inclusion within the unchanged patriarchal capitalist system to a fundamental transformation of the system. We need a feminist movement and feminist leaders. And a feminist movement chair that seeks to challenge the gender roles and advance a democratic vision of society in which gender, race, and class are no longer the basis for hierarchies of power and control. So therefore it is critical that we address both unequal gender power relations and women's subordination, and that we recognize the, ra the racialized and class-based uh, nature of patriarchy. We also believe that we need to move chair beyond talking about formal gender equality, which remains an inspirational statement. And instead, we must focus on concrete measures for gender equity. And we must clearly distinguish chair between gender equality and gender equity. Because gender equity is not the same as equal rights and opportunities for women and men. Yes, it recognizes that unequal position of women in relation to men and that addressing this requires different treatment to ensure equality in access and outcomes. As a federation, we are saying we want to share an economy that benefits all, an economy that recognizes all, an economy that recognizes and acknowledges the invisible unpaid labor of women, an economy and society that recognizes the humanity and potential of every human being, regardless of their gender, their disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. We need an economy chair that is transformed from the one that has only a mercenary and utilitarian approach to men and women in the economy. Yeah, we are saying this person. economy must be based on mutual and solidarity approach. And we want to say, Chair, that if COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we can only survive and thrive in solidarity and caring and supportive communities. Now, COSATU has held a collective bargaining conference where we reasserted- okay, President, you are rounding up. Yes, Chair where we reasserted the point that collective bargaining can make a significant difference for women workers by reducing the gender pay gap, combating low pay, valuing women's work and addressing gender discrimination and safety in the workplace. Now, we are also calling for the ratification of convention 190 chair because there we will be able to deal with the challenges that women in particular and uh, LGBTI community are confronted with. And in conclusion, Chair, we have argued that the living and working conditions for black working class women must be at the center of our struggle for women's emancipation and non-sexism. We must advance policies and campaigns to challenge the structure. Thank you, President. 
of women's oppression and the unequal gender, race, and class power relations in our society. Thank you very much, Che. Thank you very much, Comrade Lucy. Comrade Lulama, you take the Thank floor you very as a man for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mamumu Mutisa, Sustandi. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in this particular platform as the only man, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the, the, uh, before I start, a stalwart and a veteran, Comrade Ndomazana Bortha, requested me to convey her best wishes to you all and wished for a sustained discussion on gender equality towards a fully non sexist society. Further, she said leadership structures is a mirror of the intent of any organization. Therefore, for the ANC to turn the tide on gender equality, she says, it must adopt a principled deliberate approach on having a top six and equivalent to provincial structures, uh, top fives that are gender equalized. That's, that is what she said. She said. Now, as, as part of the introduction, Comrade uh, Chair, uh, the African National Congress in this strategy and tactics document understands that women emancipation and gender equality constitutes the third and interrelated contradiction in South African society. In addition to the class and national question, as said by Comrade Lucy, it's important that we make this particular session on the strategy and, and tactics document because it's a, it's a principal guide for our struggle for a non and racial non sexist South Africa. This recognition, first, first, Firstly, means that the struggle for women in space cannot be understood outside its relationship to the national and class struggles. We must appreciate that the realization of a prosperous and a vibrant democracy is tarnished by the continued prejudices faced by women and worse off the violence against women and gender non-conforming -conforming persons. The stats show that, uh, the statistics show that uh, more than 55% of the population of South Africa are women. And therefore, any prejudice against women is a prejudice against uh, the nation. I'm certain that we all appreciate that gender relations are power relations in line with what Comrade Lucy uh, uh, spoke about. This means to fundamentally address imbalances in the gender relations, we have to deliberately shift power relations by broadening the participation of women in strategic sites of our economy, position of power, and influence and in other sites of influence in line with what Comrade E to have said. Therefore, the fight for gender equality and ending the violence against women should not only be conceived and perceived through the moralist lenses or acts that can only be remedied through legal means, but to around an ever in political and social agenda. Therefore, it is a matter which we need to mobilize the society using all available platforms and avenues. This recognition should therefore mean that we ought to pursue this struggle with the same level of vigor as we did to the institutionalized racism, uh, economic ex exclusion, and inequality. When we talk of radical transformation, Chairperson, we need to also infuse the issue that relates to non-sexism um, non as part of and parcel of the broader struggles that should be waged by the South African population. We need to move away from relegating gender inequality to, to, an, issue just, to, to an issue just to be fought and be led by women alone towards a reimagination of a society that will be collectively rid itself of patriarchy, toxic masculinity, and misgoing in, in line with what uh, Comrade Mavivi spoke about in, in her historical account. President uh, um, Samora Marshall correctly captures the importance of the complete liberation of women as a key feature of a revolution when he says, open quote, the liberation of women is not an act of charity. It is not the result of humanitarian on, or compassionate position. It is a fundamental necessity for the revolution, a guarantee of its continuity and condition for its success, uh, close quote. This quotation is so important as we continue with our revolutionary tasks. Our constitution as outlined by the minister and the presidency presents a, a set of progressive uh, social values and principles. 
It serves as a principal basis from which all of us must assimilate and body both in our private and public lives. These progressive values include freedom, human dignity, equality, non-racialism, and non-sexism. I'm, I'm pointing the issue that relates to non-sexism as a constitutional imperative in South Africa. The gender policy framework, which is South African vision for gender equality, further enriches these values and provides a progressive framework for fighting the scourge. The establishment of the Ministry of Women in the Office of the President was an assurer of the seriousness of a creation of gender balanced society. And the Presidential Summit declaring, declaration is yet another policy reaffirmation of the position of our government concerning fight against gender based violence. We know that it is not enough, but the policy framework uh, at least has been articulated very well insofar as dealing with the matter. Gender abuse is increasingly normalized and underreported, unfortunately, on the part of the realities, the lived re re realities. The scourge affects all strata of society, irrespective of education, the status of the social status, and the economic wealth. A study conducted by the MRC indicated that one out of four women in South Africa had experienced physical violence at some point in their lives. Moreover, a report released by Statistics South Africa in 2018 titled uh, Crime Against Women in South Africa reported that 250 out of every 100,000 women were victims of sexual offenses. These statistics are comparable to nations which are in a social conflict such as uh, civil wars. Now, it means that uh, the status of women in South Africa is as if the country is in a war and this cannot be allowed. Given the background, I believe the fight against gender-based violence will have to be collectively carried out across all terrains of struggle, including, including boardrooms, workplaces, homes, villages, in church and in the streets. We have to adopt an unwavering commitment to sustaining our campaign for broader participation of women in the economy, and we uh, should ensure that we, uh, we approach it to ensure that we have a free and genuine egalitarian society. This is in the interest of our country and our new nation. Proposed uh, for a way forward chair, uh, there must be a campaign. That campaign must be a campaign for a non-sexist country. The ANC must use the experience learned over a period of decades from the history of our struggle for, to overcome the fundamental contradictions faced by our society, we have learned valuable lessons that need to be utilized in the fight against gender inequality. As we deepen the fight and campaign, we must ensure maximum support from all progressive sections, and we seek to win over those elements which have not yet transformed and embraced the progressive ideals uh, of democratizing gender relations and ending the violence was directed mainly to women. As such, the campaign must incorporate broad front and message of the campaign. Once again, the person must be putting men at the cold front of fighting against at least the gender-based violence. The United Nations High-Level Panel on Women Emancipation identified following seven key drivers for transformation and detailed program of action should then be developed around each of the drivers. Those drivers, Comrade Chairperson, I will uh, uh, briefly talk uh, uh, to them. The first one, the first driver is tackling adverse norms and promoting positive role models. The challenging and transforming the negative and harmful norms that limit women's access to work and that often devalue their work are core to achieving women's economic uh, empowerment in line with what Comrade Pelosi has spoken about. about. In our context, the interface of gender with cultures, traditions, and customs reflect a particular area that warrant urgent intervention. Then the National General Council has to pay attention to that particular matter. Interface between gender, cultures, uh, and traditions. Moreover, while at societal level, we continue to make gains in the equalization genders, genders through the legislated uh, framework, in lived experiences, these, remain, these rights remain contested 
in both public and private spaces, whereas in rural and township areas. The second driver is, the, uh, is ensuring legal protection and reforming discrimina discriminatory laws and regulations. Laws uh, reflect society's expectation for gender rules by guaranteeing equal opportunities and protections and by removing, removing legal barriers, government sig signals their commitments to achieve and enforce gender equality. This is one of the areas that we have managed at least to progress as a South Africa in terms of the legislations and policies. Our policies are progressive, and but the practice out there uh, leaves much to be desired. Current institutionalized institutional mechanisms on GPV like the police court to disaster centers, et cetera, need to be revived and transformed as they have proven to be ineffective in addressing the problem of gender-based violence and femicide. Our campaign should also focus on auditing and revitalizing the mechanisms that are already in place uh, to ensure that uh, effective and functioning of uh, these uh, centers function optimally. This includes ensuring that police stations are adequately equipped to deal with cases of gender-based violence. That cases of GPV are given priority in police stations and courts. That to the last centers and other support mechanisms are, uh, are functional. It is also evident that we need to review the existing legislations and enact new laws and policies meant to combat gender-based violence. I hear the comrade uh, uh, one is saying there are laws that they are putting in place. I think that should be celebrated. You are rounding up. In rounding up, uh, the driver number three is the recognition, redu reducing and redistribu redistributing unpaid work and care. The fourth one is the building assets, digital, financial, and, proper and property. The fifth one is changing business, culture, and practice. The Next one is improving public sector practices. The seventh one is strengthening visibility, collective voice, representation, which is about the mobilization of the society as the core and principal agent to deal with the issue that relates to gender-based violence and uh, sexism in our areas uh, of, of, uh, of, 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 of staying. Conclusion, Chairperson, what needs to be done? I will just sketch them down, uh, please, Chair. In one we minute. Need, in one minute. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Assistant. Adopt a community-based approach, community-based organization, civil society, academics, religious, and traditional organization should be clapped together to fight against this. Men should be put at the forefront and evoke and have voice against patriarchy and inequality as a main cause of the gender-based violence. Identify areas that need specific inter intervention in terms of the policy. Uh, transformation, strengthening capacity of the ANC, and ensure that the ANC itself establishing establishes uh, the gender uh, 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 champions in all its structures. Um, and secondly, the last issue, Comrade Mazana Bwaza says once again, ANC must lead by example. If we are still uh, we are still perpetrating the patriarchal tendencies within the organization our society will not embrace the constitutional imperatives. I close. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Thank you minutes. very much. On that note, um, the only prisoner for the day, the Swash, Comrade Jenny Schreiner, please take the floor. You are muted, my friend. Unmute. I am unmuted. <laughs> Comrade Tandi, thank you very much for giving us the, the platform and greetings to the panelists, to the participants, and to people following this, this Umkhobula this morning. Uh, we greet you in the year of the centenary of the Communist Party. And uh, I would like to speak in honor of communist women who have dedicated themselves to the liberation of this nation and to the building of socialism in, in our country. It was interesting listening to the historical presentation of Comrade Mavivi and listening to the number of communist women that she was saluting um, and as in, in their contribution to the, the, the history of organizing women in the trade union movement, in the women's movement, um, as well as in our political organizations. 
our approach is that building a, a non-sexist society, building a society eradicating patriarchy requires structural social change, and that social change comes through struggle and organization. So a key part of what we would be wanting to highlight in today's discussion is the importance of ensuring that women are mobilized and organized into the motor forces of our revolution and are able therefore to change the gender relations in society that are not natural pre-existing relations, they are social relations, they are designed by the, the, the society that exists, they are designed by the balance of forces and therefore they can be changed. We also would like to strongly emphasize the importance of us being extremely sensitive to our language. We talk about women's emancipation, but in an era in which we recognize that there is a gender continuum, that the binary polarity of men and women is not scientifically based and nor is it socially and culturally based. So we need to ensure that the the, the, the location of issues from the LGBTI community are also centrally placed in our struggles for gender equality. A number of the, 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 the presenters have referred to the importance of uh, understanding the interface and the interconnectivity and the reinforcing of the racial oppression, patriarchal oppression and class exploitation and oppression. In relation to that, we need to be very conscious in South Africa in particular, but globally about re reverting back to using a category of women as if it is a, a homologous category. Uh, it is a category that is cut across by race and class um, cultural uh, divides. And we need to ensure that we are, are very sensitive to how those pan out in the reality that we are trying to change. It's also important flowing from that, that when we're talking about women um, and the promotion of women, be it in political leadership, in the economy and wherever else, that we are conscious also of the importance of promoting women with a conscience, women with a particular consciousness. And Comrade Lawsey has already reflected on the, 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 the extent to which liberal feminism is, is reasserting itself. We need in this process to really in, in embed ourselves in a rich history of South African left feminism uh, that goes back not just through the, the history that we've been discussing today, but goes back even before that. And let's build on, on that, that process. Our approach is, is one of gender mainstreaming, a, an area in which South Africa has made enormous gains in our gender monitoring, our gender responsive budgeting, um, and, and our gender sensitive law, our gender sensitive constitution as the overarching uh, framework within we operate. But we need to struggle around that. And we need to struggle in particular within our organizations, be they our political organizations, be they the National Assembly, be it the labor movement, be it the community organizations, be it NEDLAC. Um, and our own approach as, as the South African Communist Party is that it is a, an ongoing struggle to raise an internal battle of ideas as well as fighting the external battle of ideas. It is a process of trying to ensure that we are constantly looking at the gender implications of any uh, policy position that we adopt. And therefore, when we talk about the fourfold crisis of capitalism, we are acutely aware of the fact that it has a very particular and a disproportionate impact on the majority of women. And the majority of women, we're talking about black working class, uh, urban and rural women who bear the brunt of the economic crisis, of the social reproduction crisis, of the health crisis, and the environmental and climate change crisis. And it's perhaps important for us to reflect on, on our understanding of why this has a particular impact on the, the process of, of women. And obviously it's because of patriarchy and the exclusion of women, but fundamentally that is located in the gender division of labor within the family the, and in the household. It results in the double day. It results in the unpaid labor of, of women. It results in the woman carrying uh, a disproportionate burden in relation to uh, the, the care economy. Um, that is, 
the basis and informs the manner in which people, women are incorporated into society. It in, is embedded in our culture, our religion, our patriarchal and sexist ideology, and those all then require us to engage with that and change. Our approach also is that the fourfold crisis of capitalism is not something that is unique to South Africa. It is a global situation. It has particular um, aspects in our country because of the, the transitional stage that, that we are in, but it also then requires us to ensure that our approach to building a non-sexist and gender equal society is also one that is infused with international solidarity. So whether it is the women in Palestine, the women in um, Venezuela, the women in Cuba, whether it is the women in India, uh, we need to be alert to the, the conditions and struggles and also learn from the struggles that are taking place uh, internationally. Uh, Comrade Ito spoke on the, the, the issues of women in the informal sector and the gig economy, and those are issues that, that really do need our, our immediate attention in the COVID crisis, which has highlighted the inequalities that exist in South African society in the most incredibly stark manner. So we need to ensure that we are looking at the employment opportunities, both formal and informal, and support strongly the process of uh, formalizing the informal sector as a key part of the economic reconstruction and, and development program uh, that, that, we, that the country needs to, to be driving. But in that, we also need to look at the extent to which the, the, the social wage gains that we've made uh, in, in the time of our democracy have been rolled back. Uh, those amenities provided by within a society from public funds, be they maternity leave, be it public funded daycare for children, um, be it uh, the, the, the basic income grant or the social relief uh, distress grant at the moment, those are all issues that we need to be campaigning around and taking up very strongly. None of them will be handed to us on a plate. The level of organization and the level of mobilization, and I want to emphasize what has been raised by a number of people, the importance of us ensuring that there is mass organization around issues that impact on women um, in a broad front that is able to ensure that we win these, these demands. Our approach to the um, the, the economic uh, recovery is also to ensure that the solidarity economy, the social economy, the women cooperatives uh, is, a, is a very strongly uh, developed part of that program. But in particular, and I think this is where a, a lot of, of people have, have indicated our ability to have policy that we are not implementing. Part of it is, are we resourcing those strategies? In relation to the social reproduction crisis, our inability uh, for the majority of people to sustain the livelihoods of ourselves and our families. Our Red October campaign, which focuses on hunger, human settlements, water, um, and health is a critical part of the strategy that we are adopting to address these, these issues. Again, a program that we are mobilizing broadly into a front around these issues to be able to take forward those demands. One minute left, Comrade Jenny. Sure. Uh, in, in relation to that, um, indeed, GBV and femicide is indeed a fundamental human security issue. And this is not something that is new. This is something that has been argued in South Africa over the last 20 years. And it is something that we really do need to be able to, to put forward. Um, let me, let me wrap up by, by indicating that we are at a stage at which our NDR is challenged from in essentially two directions. One, there has been a consistent uh, process over the three uh, past three, three decades of asserting a neoliberal agenda. And we need to understand that neoliberalism fundamentally undermines any strategy to build equality on a gender perspective. It has profoundly failed black working class women in, in this country in its attempts uh, to, to deal with development. So that is the one angle that, that we need to, to defend the national democratic revolution against. And the other obviously 
is the issues of uh, the corruption and parasitic networks. And the key question for us is what then is the role of us as women and us as gender activists, and there I include men who are gender activists, what is our role in ensuring that those strategies that fundamentally undermine the transformation that is necessary for gender equality, that is necessary for building a non-sexist South Africa, are in fact defended and, and taken forward. And in relation to that, the mainstreaming of gender transformation into the second more radical phase of the NDR becomes a critically important part of it. So when we look at the equity gains, you, Comrade what Comrade Lawsey has said, if I can just finish the sentence, when we pick up on the equity gains, we need to ensure that the number of women that we have in representation is transformed into the gains that are made in South Africa for the majority of South Africans, uh, the majority of South African women, which is uh, predominantly black working class women in the urban areas and the rural areas. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to try and summarize anybody, but um, it's interesting that um, the issues of loss, good loss, passed. Others are saying, let us go back. Let us see at what we can amend. But in fact, we've got good loss, which we are not policing, which we are not implementing. That's a fact. Um, Itumeleng says, ruffle the feathers. I like saying, rattle the cage, kick it, choose to challenge. Lugai Tube says, if more than 50% of our communities and nation are women, and if we treat them badly, it means we are treating half the nation badly and the nation therefore in majority badly. He also says that South Africa is like a country that is um, dealing, that is involved in the civil war because more than half of its community is living in perpetuity, in hardship, in fear. Comrade Lossi says, Vugani uh, Emakandi. Comrade Jenny says, let us look at the structures. You can't change society until you have started working at the means to change that society and its attitudes. I'm now going to ask that we throw this at whoever wants to make comments in the platform. Uh, Comrade uh, Spongy, I will need help here because I can't see people from where I am. If we have any hands, I would be happy to see those. Um, strictly speaking, we are going to be in trouble with time because we are aware that there are people who want to go to another meeting, but let's go for it. For now, I have three hands that I see, Comrade Hopapo, Comrade Halima, Comrade Lemako, Lemako. In that order, please. Uh, good morning, uh, good, good afternoon, comrades. I just wanted to raise an issue were we correct when we talked about social and economic transformation of our society from the perspective of the RDP and other programs which followed without looking at what happens in a family? I mean, some of us took years to accept this kind of uh, arrangement of a man and a woman in a family. Um, but we had, we, got to, we had to be convinced because that's how society is. But is that correct? Because many, I think many of the problems start there uh, of attitude, socialization, values. Um, and, and some of the, what we call sexism, sexist views, sexist practice. For me, it's not about the economic foundation only. It's a combination of a whole range of factors in relation to People use religion, use culture, what they call culture, which are habits. Some of those habits are good, some of them are bad. And when we want to change the bad ones, we're told, no, the ancestors will fight against us. Now, this, this kind of thing, I think for me, it's a problem. We, need to, we needed to have dealt with how a family, because there are families which are different, single-headed, there are two mother and father, two women, two men. There are different kinds of families which South Africa has now. And now, for me, that's the issue we need to answer because I think families 
are a form of enslavement, the way they are structured. Enslavement and a lot of problems and toxicity, which we are talking about, starts from there. And then it goes to community institutions like religious formations, cultural bodies, clan meetings. You would listen to what's happening in those uh, platforms. I think it's a, it creates lots of problems for what we're trying to announce the society. We have to radically change how families are and they are run. Because what is happening now, it's actually at the base and, and at, the, at, the, at the head of the problems we have. Let me leave it there because I think Thank until you. we do that, we are, we, are, we are working backwards. Thank you, Comrade Ho. I then had Comrade Halima. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and greetings to all in the platform. I would like to touch specifically on the issue of capacitation. I think, uh, as we have heard, much has been done and there needs to be implementation. One of the hugest institutions is the government workforce. As we've seen it, it's uh, within even the COVID era, it championed a government which was functional. And I feel from that perspective, also being uh, um, uh, having been in all level, three levels of government, capacitation of government employees in line with understanding the issues of gender emancipation is very critical. Yes, we have other sectors that form, form outside of that, but it's a conversion. It's already where people are organized. There should be an enforcement of gender understanding and gender equity within this particular platform. And I feel if the approach as led by the uh, a National School of Government of even right now as government officials, we're forced to learn on ethics so that we can have an ethical uh, 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 government institution. But in terms of gender, I do feel that um, as I am within the institution, you find that there are senior managers who do not understand the issue of gender emancipation and equity. Now, remember, the playing field is such that municipalities where the masses live, uh, you know, this issue is not understood by people who lead the municipalities themselves. So there should be this conversion and enforcement of them having to understand the element and issues of gender and um, ensuring that all the policies are in fact adhered to. We, we look at the numbers in terms of even the equity element in this uh, particular uh, uh, area being implemented. It's not, and it shouldn't be a choice. Government is led by the government of the day. It should allow for programs to be installed there because then they will spill over to the communities because you find that um, in this particular level, you have the politicians, you have the administrators, and you have the public participating in the IDB processes. So this is one of the most organized uh, 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 fields, playing field that could be used to champion. It should be, uh, uh, an APP target of every senior manager to transform uh, the gender mainstreaming. It should be an APP target because they get, we as government officials and all government officials get paid to champion what's in the APP target. target. And that way you are already dealing with the problem from a perspective of empowerment econom economically, uh, because we already have the radical economic transformation and the procurement laws that are not even being adhered to. Um, some of us as government officials being academics as well have written uh, resource documents which um, can assist where we are at because we feel other than doing our work, we must be champions of the gender uh, 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 agenda at large within the institutions so that our colleagues and peers could understand this from a broader perspective. Being a government official is not, not about coming to work and earning a salary. It's about championing the agenda of government and the government of the day broadly. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Comrade Halima, Comrade Lumako, Lemako, Lemako. Thank you, Comrade Chair, Comrade Tandi, and all uh, the comrades who are in this uh, roundtable discussion. My point will be that the ANC branches as the basic unit must champion this uh, program of uh, non-sexist society because 
if the ANC branches, we don't play our part where things are happening, we can't win the battle against uh, uh, this war. We must make sure that we are deepening the understanding of our people. We are working with progressive organization on the ground because these issues, they don't happen at the provincial level, at the national level. They must be championed from the level of the branches. The ANC through its a political program must have a way of monitoring as it implement this uh, policy. So we don't have that. And I think it's time now that we create that platform where the branches as the leader of society, they are having a system of really um, weighing up that we are indeed, um, uh, we are realizing this uh, policy of non sexist society. We, we feel that we can't. And the RDCs and PCs maybe have a way of uh, monitoring or evaluating when they report, they get the reports from these branches that there is a progress or not. Also, it must be a matter of being creative that we include this matter as part of the school's curricula so that we taught our children from early age about the importance of issue of um, um, equal society, where we, we need people who understand that the issue of gender is not only the issue of human, but the last issue is that we need to also to re really work on our female comrades, that there are some comrades who are still working against other uh, women as women. So if we say that we have women who don't protect other women, we have a problem. So we must do a lot of work on the ground so that people understand that we have a role as a society, as the branches of ANC to implement these policies. Because failing that, We'll just talk, talk is cheap, but the implementation of policies is very key. Thank you very much, Comrade Tan. Whole panel to, to respond. I had Comrade Nokolo. Thank you, um, Comrade Chair. Thank you to the panel for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, however, we do need to legislate the free dispensation of sanitary towels to young women and girls who cannot afford them. Um, with lockdown, it taught us that government is very agile and willing, where there is political will, to implement new new programs like when we got locked down free data was distributed to all students across the country to ensure that they could attend and continue their education online so we've been calling for the free dispensation of sanitary towels to women and girls who cannot afford them till today we have girls that cannot attend school because they don't have sanitary towels when they are on their periods I'd also like to thank Comrade Jenny on her uh, great contribution on this stance. And we really need to look at the gender role of women in the household in this fourth industrial revolution, because women are working from home and now they have to play all the roles of being a, a primary caregiver, a mother and an employee in one household at the same time, which, push, which puts a lot of pressure on women um, in terms of working and unpaid labor. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Narcolo. Comrade Moluku. Moluku. Are you there? If Moluku is not there, I will move on to Comrade uh, Helen. Helen Sauls. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, Sistandi, and to all the panelists for a well thought out uh, presentations. Um, it almost takes us to the point to ask uh, uh, this discussion, uh, if you use all the resource documents, it would actually for form the basis of the NGC discussion. But uh, Comrade Chaperson, I think one of the issues uh, that we we lack it as the ANC is not the formulation of policies. And we all agreed it is the implementation of those policies. 
Now the issue you should ask yourselves, what have we done wrong in the last 27 years of our democracy by not implementing those radical policy directives that we've taken at our conferences? And what is the reason that we've not been able to implement that? And unless we have that analysis of the policy uh, framework that we've set uh, there of all the challenges embedded, we are forever going to speak about these issues and continuously raise new policies. Last year, the ANC came out clear there must be programs from branch, region, province to national dealing with the issue of gender-based violence and femicide. And we've made that call. We need to ask ourselves, why is it that it got stuck possibly at regional level and it could not cascade down to the branch level effective, notwithstanding the fact of for, for COVID? And I think those are the kind of questions that we now need to ask ourselves. Why not? What is preventing us? Uh, what is a hindrance? Is it, is it cost? Is it human resource? Uh, or is it just an issue that we need a paradigm shift or there's a rebutting from a certain sector of the population wanting to implement and having a, a, a gender a free society and a non-sexist society in South Africa. Uh, but well done to all the panelists and hoping that the and everybody that has inputted there. Thank you so much that I could form part of this. Thanks. Thank you, Comrade Helen. Comrade Ndlovu. Morning, everyone. Yes. Morning, everyone. Oh. Um, just a thank quick you, one. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a quick one. I, I would like to celebrate Umamu Charlotte Matraike in, 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 I guess, in, in beautiful manner in that the International Women's um, theme this year is, is choose to challenge. This is what Umamu Charlotte did from 1912 when many women were still almost abiding by the common laws that were there. But she's, she chose to stand up and challenge the patriarchal system that men had, and which is why we're here today. And I think it's such a great honor for her to be celebrated in the same year that the thing is just to challenge. But moving on quickly to, to issues of today, um, I think gender-based um, violence is, is a category within um, women's struggles and the transformation aspect is. We've lost you a little bit. Pardon me? We had lost you. Oh, uh, sorry about that. I'm saying we need to separate the gender-based violence in terms of femicide and, and, and the violent aspect of, of, of gender and, and the role of women in, in society in, in relation to transformation. Now, women in, in fall, fall within a society. Now, if we are already in a society that is untransformed, we simply mean what the society is. I mean, if we look at the trends that we have in relation to transformation, 91% of CEOs are white males and only 9% are African. Now, within that 9% is, is, is women. So if already, you have a society that only holds 9% in transformation, it will follow that women are, are going to suffer in relation to whatever the statistic in society is, which follows through to the CEOs, the chairpersons and the board of directors in those stats. Now, um, going to Beijing 26, women set out great goals, uh, which is the generation that came prior to us. Um, now, those goals that were set up, uh, in 1994 with 95, 11% of women participating in, in parliament and globally, and that number has moved to 25%. With South Africa, I guess, contributing much to that, which is sitting at 45%. We thank you to all the women-led chairs in parliament that have moved the number from, two, from the two, uh, almost 3% to the 45% that we have. But politics, is not broader society, which is what then we start to feel in other sectors. Yes, parliament has transformed, um, giving the nudge to, to, to the international standard in terms of how governments have transformed. But when you come back to society in terms of business, 
uh, there we're still lagging with only women constituting about 6% of board of directors. Now there are many women I think that uh, qualify to be in these positions, but we don't see that. But like I said uh, earlier, it is a mirror of the society that we have. So Sislo so, so touched on it and I think um, uh, Itu as well touched on, on, on the issues of transformation. To say before we look at, at, at women in particular, but are we operating in, in, a, in a society that already is enabling um, that kind of, of, of change? Um, and moving to, to the pay gap um, issue, I think we have enough laws and I think many of us have mentioned the fact that we're not implementing those, which is why we have um, the issue of pay gap coming up. And I think um, government and, and, and the leaders of society should take that up because we know that women not only support themselves, right? We, we've lost you. Um... And if so you could round up, please. Rounding up is basically to, to agree to what Uu, I hope uh, mentioned that um, the family plays a, an important role because if we don't drive behavioral change within our families, because before it becomes a police matter or a police case, it starts within a home. So. Uh, I agree your network is on very unstable on, on, on that point that money that ah. your Hello? network is unstable and I'm also pressed for yes, time. So. Your network is unstable. I can now move on to Comrade yes. Chabi Sawana. Uh, and I concur with, with uh, Comrade Hope. Comrade Wana, Tabiso. Can you hear me? We can Chair hear President, you. Can you hear me? Please go on. Oh, thank you. Good, 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 good day to everybody. Let me appreciate the inputs of the panelists. First and foremost, Chairperson, I'm very disappointed the manner of this discussion of Mkhabulok for the NGC. There's no preamble that gives us a very conscious mood because there's no data that we said ever since NGC that year we've managed to improve in terms of non-sexist and emancipation of women. There's no percentage that we can say ANC has done. And secondly, my disappointment, Chairperson, is that even that there's no programs that has been tested after that NGC saying there are many women that have been taken across our aligned countries in terms of Russia and other countries to empower them practically because we can't move as fast as we're supposed to according to this and this input is silent about the current situation of this biological warfare that is women we are faced with because every now and then we are emotionally abused by saying that there's a third wave which is coming and that that thing, that thing is we I must be clear that we are dealing with the biological warfare who are exploiting women in particular secondly i appreciate what has been said by mama Ma vivi and what has been tabled by 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 our president Losi, because if you can calculate, if the that if the population is saying women are the majority today, exploitation is designed to the women because agreement that was signed to help the workers in South Africa has been violated by the same organization that we are having a hope in it. How many women are workers in on the ground that today when they are expected to have their own salary to be improved according to the economy? Our own government has said, no, they are not going to have anything. And who is going to do that? Comrade Mujisa, you have been all along on the trenches, but there are issues because if you can analyze properly the issue of this emancipation and the hypocrisy that has been given by the main 
comrades in it. It's very, very critical. But because we are disciplines of the left, we don't say everything that is wrong. We must appreciate the little that we have. Secondly, in this NGC that we are going to, we must have a detailed information that what has happened is APC so that we can be psychologically empowered and ideological understanding that the emancipation of women, how men have been trained in, in Vietnam in terms of bankings and so forth, because women should be in the forefront there's no other appreciating statements that can make us go back to these people in the rural areas where we are staying. Because all these men comrades who are leading, they are, they are closing the, the gaps for themselves. But if it's a woman, they will tell you that the women have got no capacity. In all these boards in South Africa, in, board, in boardrooms, there are majority of men. So, uh, I, I'm missing you, Chairperson. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. My last name is Michael Sechapo. Your comrade Michael? If you are not here, Thank that's you. okay. Are you there? No, no. You are not here. Is there somebody called Michael Suhapo? The hand was up, that's why I picked it up. If the comrade is no longer talking, then I hand back to the panel. Comrade Mavivi, are you ready? Yes, Chair, I'm ready. Yes, my sister, take the floor. And uh, the other members of the panel, and uh, you can come in to issues raised, maybe directed at your own inputs. Comrade Mavivi, you have the floor. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with a challenge which I was supposed to raise at the end of my presentation, mm. but due to time, I couldn't. And this is going to challenge, actually, those women like Comrade Losi, like oh, Comrade Jenny Schreiner, and many others whom we call the advanced cadres of our movement and the vanguard of our struggle. I think the history which I was trying to put across was to show how difficult it was for women to raise the issue of the emancipation of women and gender equality. We all know that we were, those women who raised it were called to be divisive, but they continued to push. For some of us, we base actually our experiences on issues of women, on scientific findings of authors like Engels. We believe right from the beginning when we started this issue that it cannot be only the task of the ANC. I believe the ANC has done its job, but the Vanguard movement at this point in time is called upon to continue with that struggle and to raise the issues which Lossi raised which Jenny Roy raised as this is what brought us to the level we are, where the ANC had to change from being a patriarchal society uh, organization 
of excluding women to the point in which it is at the present moment. The contribution also from the floor, I think from the comrades speak of what I'm trying to put across, which is the radical transformation of our society. It cannot lay on the ANC only. The comrades with the theory and the practice and the call for implementation cannot happen if we do not go back to that theory propounded by Bo Engels and many other women who led us into this issue of the emancipation of women. Commitment, dedication at this point in time is lacking. And that's why maybe some of this implementation is not happening in the ANC or in government. It is a difficult issue, this issue of emancipation, gender relations, because it hinges on the total transformation of our country. And that transformation as most presenters and also those who contributed from the floor, who haven't achieved, which is economic liberation of our country and total decolonization. Without those aspects, I think we'll continue to speak about the women's emancipation not being achieved and blaming the ANC. And I don't think we should do that. The ANC is a mass movement. It has all these characters in it. And in the name of unity and progress, we have put people in various positions as the ANC in order to achieve this unity. And I must say, some of them whom we thought as communists, as workers, when they join government, they will be able to refocus the ANC government into some of these issues, which we call strategic gender needs. The ANC has focused on practical gender needs, which is education, health, etc. To move forward from this practical gender needs, which will totally transform our society and address the various issues we've been raising of violence against women, of unequal pay, will need a new cadre. And I think that's what the NGC should be discussing. The new cadre which we need in the African National Congress, in the Alliance, and also in government, who will lead us to pursue what we believe in, what the women who were before us believed in, they were very clear that this was going to be a difficult struggle and it needs a new cadre to stand up and articulate those strategic gender issues which are around the issue of patriarchy a very difficult system. I know it's going to be very difficult comrades, but this is what I believe we should continue with the struggle which the ANC has begun and make sure that theory and practice 
is intensified within our movement. And we have those brave and dedicated cadres who will raise these issues. And as I say, mm -hmm. the women who led us in the past did this through tears. We need those tears at the present moment. Many of us are just protecting our position and afraid to raise these issues. We cannot rely on the Women's League because it's part of the ANC. We have to find a way of building a new cadre, even within the Women's League itself, who will be able to take up very difficult issues which have been raised in this discussion. So I wish all of us well as we lead to the NGC. We must start speaking a different language, which will take us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Mavivi. Indeed, we need to relook at ourselves if we are to achieve anything and to survive as the ANC and the progressive movement in South Africa in general. We are under siege and we seem to be digging our own grave even deeper. Comrade uh, Itu, do you want to say anything in closing? Comrade Maite? I think... Yes, Itu. Comrade, uh, just in closing, I'd say that... Um, you do, you do, let's, you do, you know, you do, you do, you you are unstable again. you do, Specialization, and I think Oh yeah, you are better now. The code that was put. Yeah, I know. Yes, ma. Oh no, your network is very yeah. unstable. Maybe let's My take time. Comrade Maite and come back to you. Give you a few minutes. Can for you hear me? Time. Yes, now. Okay. If I was you... just saying, just maybe a few words with regard. Are you able to move a bit? Okay, now we've lost you completely. Uh, Comrade Maite, anything? Thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Assistant. I think Comrade Mavivi has said it all. Safe to say that um, when we said Unzi Malomutual Ufuna Seshangane, I think. That's the way to go. Working together, we shall do more. But also listening to each other. If, Sister Andy, you say to me, Maite, here you have done wrong, I should give you a, he a, a, a hearing. That's the only way we can fight this. Not to the, to the finish, if there is. Uh, the, how, how do we free ourselves from gender-based violence and femicide? Is to do exactly what the president said we must do. I don't know who's going to study it because we seem to be, our hands are tied because we don't have financial muscle, so we do not have financial access, but, I think one thing we can do is to go department by department and see where this 40% procurement can take place. That way we'll be talking action and uh, action now. We have, uh, for those who say we, we've missed two years of training, it's true. It's almost two years that the globe has been suffering from this thing that we don't know called COVID-19. There is no aircraft that will collect 
people from country A to B because of this thing. So if we are to use IT for training, maybe that will be our way to deal with the new normal because that's really the way we should go. There is no solution in us looking for somebody else to bring solution to us except ourselves. I just want to say, thought I should say that for now. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so very much, Comrade Maite. Uh, comrades, um, I feel that we do need, uh, it do, have you stabilized? And the reason I feel we must give Itu a chance is that um, we young people must not continue to look at us. Um, young people younger than me, younger than 40, must begin to consciously look at what Comrade Jenny referred to as that conscious member. So consciency and consciousness must begin to be something that troubles us. We must not just be looking at age and, and, and gender and, and, uh, and leadership. We need to be beginning to see to it that we don't only enact. Because I don't think most of our problems in the movement are about money. It is about just having the guts to stand up to what we believe we are and what the ANC, the SACP, COSATU stood for and said, this is why we are in alliance. So for me, sometimes the fundamentals don't need money. They need us to just stand up. Stand up for what we believe in. Um, from the respondents, do I have anybody who wishes to throw in something? Comrade Jenny, you want to say something? Comrade Lossi, Comrade, uh, our only man of the day, Lulama? This Comrade is last chance. Yes, I would like to just uh, make a couple of comments, please. Can I proceed? Proceed. Um, firstly, just to say that uh, from, from the party side, we take up Comrade Mavivi's challenge 100%. Um, the importance of deepening our theory and practice on gender equality and ensuring that in the process of reconfiguring our alliance, we also ensure that it is a gendered focused uh, reconfiguration is, is critically important. Um, we've had the courage to face apartheid guns. We must have the courage to continue to challenge um, and ensure that we can, can make progress. In, in that relation. I wanted to pick up on the issue that um, a Comrade Hope raised and a couple of other people responded to in relation to the, the issue of the family. And in fact, it's fundamentally important because across, I think all cultures, the family is treated as a sacrosanct institution, something that one should not challenge. Um, as a young girl growing up in uh, English speaking, South African liberal tradition, um, liberal culture, even there, the, the issues of transforming the family are, are something that are extraordinarily difficult. So cultural change is something that we need to problematize. We, we tend to veer away from it because it's such a sensitive area, but the process of socialization in family, school, cultural institutions and society is critical. The issue around sanitary dignity got me to, to, to think about the, the fact that women's unique life cycle is something that is either used in society to control and limit women's participation. We're all familiar with, with cultures in which during a, a woman's menstrual period, she is taboo. She must stay at home. She must be out of sight. She uh, cannot participate. Um, so there's not only the physical exclusion because people don't have, women don't have access to, to sanitary pads, but there's also the cultural and taboo. So 
society either uses the unique life cycle to control and limit women or to empower women. And we have got to do that transformation that enables us to empower women. So it deals with not only sanitary pads, but it deals with menstrual hygiene infrastructure. How many women have been into a public toilet and there is no facility to be able to get rid of your, your menstrual pad? Um, if women are using a... Uh, a, a, a pit latrine, uh, uh, a communal toilet facility, uh, do those accommodate menstrual hygiene? Pregnancy support, breastfeeding, and then the, the process of women going through menopause, all of those are issues that society has got to own and put in place the infrastructure and services to be able to address it. The last aspect that I want to, to really raise up is that if one looks back to the period of the history of women's organization in the 1980s, we had a really strong, and going into the early 90s, we had a really strong progressive mass women's organization in which women were being mobilized around a range of issues. And in that process, their consciousness was being developed. I would like us to take as, as a serious challenge, as the Alliance, the commitment from, from, from this and, and going forward to build and strengthen the progressive women's movement in South Africa to ensure that we mobilize the majority of women into organizations that join the progressive women's movement. We are able to then take up the developmental challenges that face the nation and therefore face the majority of women in this country, um, whether it is women in the economy, whether it's women in the informal economy, we need all of the, the, the organizations that women are organized into. We go, women in the trade unions, uh, women in community organizations, women in the NGOs, all to be mobilized under the banner of the progressive women's movement. And that for me will take us back to being able to respond to the challenge that Comrade Mavivi has put to us so very strongly, building a participatory democracy, ensuring that the district development model is something that really does address the, the issues of women. Women hold up half the sky, to quote uh, Comrade Chairman Mao. How do we ensure that those women who are holding up half the sky have an active voice in the development, uh, the district development model that can profoundly change the, the living and, and working and uh, safety issues of women in our communities. Thank you, Comrade Chair. Thank you, Comrade Jenny. Thank you, Chair, if I may. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just want also to come in, particularly on the question that was raised about the, the family unit. Uh, you know, I, I would appreciate us going back to who we are as an African people, because our problems in this country came as a result of colonization, missionaries that came and capitalism that brought patriarchy. Because, and I want to quote uh, Baba Kleto Mutwa. He says, in African tradition, a man was not allowed to crush and dominate the woman. A man was not allowed to act unilaterally in the family. Everything he did, he had to do after having obtained the wife's fullest blessing and permission. But when, 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 when missionaries came into our country, into our shores, when we were colonized, we adopted things that we never had an, an idea of what is it. And the Bible told us, and I'm, I'm not saying religion is wrong, but they then said a man then becomes the head of the family. And we adopted that and we moved away from who we are. And I think as African people, if we were to go back to who we are and, 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 and not allow culture to be used as, as, as a scapegoat, for those that have adopted different things and come back to culture and say, because now the church has told us that we are the head of the family and now this is how things are going to be done. Even during the Shaka time, women would be the ones that will advise the kids. Women will be the ones that will remain in a matriarchal state and take care of the family. Things changed because of capitalism, because men had to move and go to towns and, and fend for their families and women were left behind. And when men came back, they came back domin uh, being dominant, having other families. And I think the family structure unit got dissipated as a result of how colonialism came to our shores and how missionaries used religion 
to try and change us from who we are as an African people. And I just want to say that until we go back to who we are, find ourselves and go back to our own origins. And I think everything else that we do would be able to deal with these issues and we'll be able to say to the kings and queens, particularly to the queens and, and the kings that this is not what you are expected to do when you lead your people. So patriarchy is not part of who we are. We must go back to Ubuntu. We must go back to who we are as an African society. But also lastly, Chair, is that uh, the ANC is in government. We have called for the reconfigured alliance. Can we move ahead with that so that we can be able also ourselves as the party and, and Kosaki to be able to respond with these things with confidence? Because now you, you, you can only make you know, an, an opinion, a view, and, and, and but if the, the structures of the ANC and, and says no to that, then it will move. Then what do we do? We go to the streets and make demands because we're not heard. We must call for the reconfigured of, uh, uh, reconfiguration of the Alliance Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that didn't look okay to me. Yes, th thanks, Stanley. A few things uh, from me. Uh, the first one, uh, I think uh, there should be an appreciation that uh, patriarchy is systematic and embedded in our social structures. Therefore, dismantling it uh, should be uh, an act of revolution and it needs, uh, we need to be deliberate and be collective and, uh, when we're dealing with it. That's the first element. But the second element is that uh, I agree with uh, Kumlis uh, about the issue that leads to the need to build uh, families that are conscious. But, but the critical element into it is us reimagining the family in the context of the current social structure. Uh, it's, uh, the, the things are not the same. Now, I, I think our minds should be a little bit uh, upfront about uh, the current social structure that is in South Africa today. The third element uh, that I think uh, is necessary is that uh, we, 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 as the organizations, we need uh, to, is, there's nothing in fact that can substitute strong organizations like what uh, Mama Vivi spoke about. Now, now, in order to tackle many of the challenges that confront the society, our responsibility is in line with the ethos of the current uh, 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 term of unity. That we should unite our organization and we should build stronger organizations in order to tackle all the social problems, whether it's about uh, race, whether it's about uh, building a nation, uh, whether it's about dealing with the issue that leads to non-sexism as exposed in the strategy and tactics of the organization. The last issue is that the revolutionary alliance must continue to refine uh, its approach on the issue that leads to gender mainstreaming and building a non-sexist uh, society. Embedded into it is the social and economic emancipation of women uh, in, in, our, in our country. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, comrades and friends, uh, um, we were given up to one o'clock. Um, we have gone to almost 25 past one. And that was also because we, we started a little bit late. But I want to thank you all for um, taking time for the debates, for the messages that have, uh, also I see the interaction amongst comrades um, for reopening the discussions on whether or not non-sexism, equality and equity, um, emancipation of women have really been achieved. And I think that uh, this is the beginning or a continuation of discussions on these matters which are really close to our hearts as women. I see on the platform that uh, my leaders are here and I want to acknowledge all of them and thank you very much and hope that uh, in the next interaction, we will, we will be as enthusiastic as we are and that uh, the challenges that the respondents and the panelists have put to us will egg us on to coming back strong and taking up the debates forward. I want to thank you for allowing me to chair this session and to wish all of us well. COVID does not play, so please keep safe. 
keep away from the sketch. I know it, 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 it is hounding us, but Makabani, please keep safe. Thank you very much for, for this. Uh, Itu, I see you, you are back. I want to thank you, especially in Wanaka, because in, when I was your age, anytime they called me Wanaka, I would get angry when I was uh, in the leadership because I thought they are making me a child. Now that I'm older, I understand that sometimes you, you take pride in seeing those younger than yourself, those who are your children's age mate coming to the fore and taking the baiting from the older ones and running. Because the whole thing is not holding you back and it is not handing. It is for you to take and to go. And for us to be pushing you from behind and, 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 and sometimes screaming at you and sometimes just praising you. So thank you very much, uh, comrades. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. This meeting is formally closed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson, and long live the chair. Thank you, baby. I'm a hero. Thank you, Mudi. Hey, bye bye, ni makavad. Bye bye, ni susa du pini ne pov. Hey, ni apa elam tanan di ni ni mana di 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 takan di takan di tosha le covid le. Hey, ni tu we are now darling sibatala. Exactly. We are darling. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Now, who's the stage? The one who's the stage, the one who's the stage, the one who's the joyana, the one who's the prof, my two.